Um, okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the Wednesday, October 13th, 2021 Conservation Commission meeting. Um, first item on the agenda are comments from me. I don't have any in particular except just to forecast that hopefully we should be able to um, move through some relatively simple hearings for the majority of the meeting, but then um, we have the Fearing Brook, um, or I guess the Fearing Street and Rad um, to tackle later in the agenda. Um, so pace yourselves. <laughs> um, but aside from that, Aaron, or I guess we don't have Dave yet, huh? Dave. We do not have Dave yet. I'm, um, I, he didn't mention that he wouldn't be here, so I'm assuming he'll be joining. Um, okay. Well, do you want to go ahead, Aaron, and then yeah, Dave sure. joins? Hi, Leroy. Welcome. Um, so I'll start with some other business items. Um, so Canton Road, um, I was out there today. They did do a bunch of plantings and I asked them to demarcate the wetland as well. They put in wooden stakes. Um, you know, the, the plantings all looked great. I didn't check them, you know, planting by planting or anything like that, but um, I could see that the plantings were done. And so I'm really relieved that, you know, there was a good faith effort made to comply with the, um, the plantings. So that's good news. Um, I do think that we should have some sort of permanent um, demarcation added where the wetland boundary is uh, as part of that, just because there is that outstanding um, subdivision order of conditions. And I know that we have an outstanding requirement from the enforcement order as well for them to survey that and have that looked at. The wetland is significantly increased from where it was before. Um, the, the cutting definitely made the wetland expand significantly. And so, um, you know, it, that piece definitely needs to be looked at. And I know that that's outstanding still as far as having an engineer review the wetland boundary in conjunction with the proposed stormwater for the subdivision. Um, but I guess my, you know, as far as that goes, I would consider them to be in compliance with the plantings at this point. They were supposed to do them by um, October 15th. So I would say that that's, that's fine. Um, as far as when they wanna proceed with the subdivision, my recommendation would be to hold to that requirement that they have the um, stormwater looked at in conjunction with the new wetland boundary. And also that the commission require a permanent demarcation on the, boundary itself to prevent any further encroachment on it. Um, other than that, it's mostly just an update for tonight. Um, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts or actions that you want me to take on that. What so kind of um, demarcation are you thinking about in terms of this situation? <clears throat> like obviously, I was trying to get away from boulders, but like, what do you think would be the best approach? Yeah, I mean, I really like the rebar wetland markers that actually have the plastic cap on them that say wetland. I've seen those work really successfully in a lot of locations. I know that they can be moved, um, but generally speaking, like in the in Amherst Hills, for example, even though on occasion you see them, you know, a couple moved here and there, for the most part, they're pretty sturdy and they stay in place. And I've seen them on other sites too, and they they do hold up over time and they're noticeable. And it's clear when people come across them what they indicate because they say wetland on them. So it's not like you're playing guessing games. Um, do you think, and so what the, you're talking about the wetlands increasing, is that going to trigger something another process or is it like is it going to screw with the current subdivision plans it could it definitely could i mean <clears throat> to be honest with you with that particular situation i'm i'm really leaning toward the commission considering an amendment to the order of conditions or just requiring them to refile um i think an amendment would be oh. fair to require in this case um because and and this is an important thing for you guys to know is that with COVID, 
when the emergency order came into effect in, I think it was like March of 20, March 15th, 2020, um, as soon as that emergency order came into play, um, through when the emergency order ceased, which I believe was, I want to say like June, 2021 or something, whatever, whenever the emergency order, um, was ceased by the governor, that window is called a tolling period. And every single permit that we have, we have to calculate the number of days that was remaining on the permit prior to it expiring, and then add that number of days back on to the end of the permit. Um, any permit that was issued during that, uh, it's very complicated. I can send you the language just so that you can understand it, but um, there's, an, there's another requirement for adding. It's like depending on when it was issued, if it was issued in a certain window, adding an additional 495 days to it. Like there's, depends on exactly when the permit was issued as to how much additional time they have. But the bottom line is that we thought that that permit expired and in fact, it did not. So. Um, are, you saying, are you saying that the amount of time the permit was in existence has increased the hours, the days, the days that it was originally set up? that that time period has increased? Right, so to give you an example, like let's say the permit was set to expire on- I'm not talking about expiration, I'm talking about the time. So if it was a period, you know, from the time when it started, it was like say a, a two year period. Because Three of, years, all permits are good for three. Okay, well, let's years. say a three year period. But so, so the three year period with this, the emergency order, is the period the thing is still in it, 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 it's still three years or is it increased? It's greater than three years if it but expired during the during the emergency I'm, order. I'm not, I'm not saying that. If you exclude no. the emergency order, okay, that time period, is it still three years that that is actually in the case, or has it become longer than three years? I'm not you, you essentially add for a permit that was in existence before the emergency order, you're essentially adding the duration of the emergency order to the, the length of the permit. That means the permit stays at the original length. It's just that it's, the, the time period has changed because there's been a stuck in there an emergency period. No, because they could have. They could if have been acting if, on the permit during the. If, during if, the, the, if, the, if the permit permit started on on uh, uh, January 1st, 2021 for three years, it would go to 2024 in three years. Because of the emergency thing, which might, let's say the emergency thing was two years. It now adds only two years to that. Am I correct? Or does it add more than So that? Larry, I don't think that we should get into the nuts and right. bolts of right. the law on because yeah, I don't I have the language in I front of me. And it, and it okay, depends fine. on exactly when the permit was set to expire and exactly when the, the, the duration of the order relative to that. That's so awesome. it's yeah. way more complicated than you think. As a matter of fact, I have consultants contacting me asking me to tell them <laughs> Um, Anna has her hand. Anna has her Sorry, hand. It's not. I stupidly just realized that I left my phone charger at work, so I'm going to drop off and rejoin. I'm so sorry. I have to rejoin on my phone, but I will be right back. Sorry. That's okay. Thanks for telling All us. Right, right back. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think what's relevant here to this yeah. to this nope, is no, that no. can nav we thought was expired. It is not. So we need to figure out how we amend that permit to move forward with any work at that site. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So I guess we'll just keep a heads up for that popping up on the agenda in coming meetings. That's thank you for that for that update, Aaron. Yeah. So that was just enforcement, and I think now that um, Dave is here, we could should jump to his report, and then um, we'll carry on with my other business later. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. That's good. I mean, I think that. I'm glad that Kit and Nav is coming to a resolution. That was painful. So thank you for shepherding that through. Um, Dave, I think you're there. Hello. We see you, Dave. We cannot hear you. Mm -hmm. And if Dave yes. stepped away, oh, 
there he is. Okay. I am here. Was having a little connectivity problems here tonight at town hall, but I'm here. Hello. Hi, Jen. Did you want me to take a couple of moments now? Yeah. Is that good for yeah, you? That's fine. Okay. Great. Yeah, I will be here for part of your, at least part of your meeting tonight. Um, yeah, uh, just a couple of quick quick updates around town. Um, uh, Aaron and I attended an event. Uh, Kestrel, uh, their new office down on Bay Road had an open house. I think it was last weekend. I'm losing track of these weekend events, but um, I spoke at the event, and um, they had uh, they invited uh, members to join them to tour their building and take a walk around the pond. I'd love to get the commission down there uh, to, to kind of talk about some of the things that we hope to do down there, take a look at um, the trail, um, the new steps are in, the permitted steps uh, that, that came through the commission uh, have been installed. Um, there are some remaining challenges down there. I want to um, talk to the commission at your next meeting about some of those challenges with, with signs, with um, we've encountered a, 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 an issue with the parking area. So there's a number of things I'd like to, to kind of uh, run through with the commission. So maybe we'll set up a site visit uh, prior to your next meeting where I can join uh, whoever uh, members of the commission who go out on the Wednesday morning site visit and um, walk around down there. We'll put a couple of things on your agenda for your next meeting. Um, I also attended, and, and you all, you all, you all were invited to the food bank uh, slash Zala conservation area um, event. I believe Anna was the only one that made it to that. That was over in Hadley. It was a wonderful event, attended by about I'm going to say 50 people, 45 to 50 people. Um, Again, Aaron was there. I spoke at it, talked about collaboration between towns, the importance of agricultural preservation, um, you know, and just cooperation and collaboration between, between communities. Um, they're actually doing some very interesting models with inviting different groups onto the property. There's me talking about one of the streams out at the, the the uh, area that was preserved. It's a pretty big project, about 195 acres total. So a really, really good size. One of the largest farms left in the town of Hadley that is not preserved. So um, still have some trail issues out there. Um, lots of work to be doing. I mean, kind of if you build it, they will come. And when people come, they, they wanna see better parking. They wanna see better signage and they wanna not get lost. So um, we've got our work cut out for us. Other events last week, and I saw some of you at the Hickory Ridge events, they were held on um, the, what was it? Seven, eight, nine, Thursday, Friday, Saturday of last week. We did some kind of open houses at the Hickory Ridge, former Hickory Ridge golf course. In total, we had, I would say a hundred, uh, excuse me, 220 people, maybe 225 between the three days, really great, Great groups, lots of questions, lots of comments. Um, the project is featured on the Engage section of our website. So if you have ideas about the property, by all means, uh, you know, any time of the day or night, if you're if you're uh, out there uh, uh, and want to jump on our town website, um, please uh, do so. We will be kicking off the master planning process for that property. Keep in mind that. Um, only a part of the property will be permanently preserved. Some of it will not. Um, and we'll have to work with and through the commission on which portions of that property are permanently protected with the conservation restriction and other uh, regulatory um, uh, layers like wetlands, floodplain, riverfront, et cetera. Um, there is considerable interest in reusing the parking area and the old clubhouse for other uses. So if you go on that engage page, you'll see everything from zip lines to pickleball to affordable housing to trails and hiking trails, biking trails, basketball courts. Um, and at this point, there's no wrong answers. We're just trying to gather community input. Um, and then lastly, I'm working with Stephanie Ciccarello on the final stages of the the um, conservation restriction that is gonna go on the old landfill as part of our project to 
um, install solar on the north landfill. There will be a about a 45 acre portion of the uh, the south landfill that will receive a, a conservation restriction. So we're working on the final uh, the final details of that, and we might need the commission's help on that. We're going to meet with our town council, and there's one, believe it or not, one little sticking point over a survey and about an acre of land that is in question. So we, we might need the commission's help on that. So we may be back to you at your next meeting on that too. So stay tuned. Dave, so some, I, can, yeah. Dave I can always help on those things too. So let me know. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is, um, yeah, this is an interesting little CR related conservation restriction related uh, item that nobody uh, really really found until 1159. So we're, we just spoke to the Natural Heritage Program today and, and we're, we're trying to come up with some options. So I appreciate that, Laura. So, so those were my four or five updates. Lots of exciting things happening out there. Um, getting ready for winter, trying to finish as much as we can on the Robert Frost Trail. That grant is due on 1231. So the more we can get done uh, between now and then the better. It's all a reimbursement grant, so that's a good thing. We get our labor and most of our labor and most of our materials uh, costs back on that. So um, we're working hard on getting more of the Robert Frost Trail done, and all of that has been uh, all of that work has been permitted uh, for the most part um, is all done. So thank you much. Thanks, Dave. Um, so we still have 10 minutes to our first hearing, if I'm not mistaken. Aaron, do you have a 10 minute or, well, you know, some small items we could handle now? Yeah, um, actually the land use application that Kestrel submitted, if we could handle that. And I see uh, uh, Chris Valente from the um, Kestrel is here. So I'm gonna promote her to the panelists so that we can review that application. Okay, great. Chris, do you, hello, welcome. <laughs> oh, we can't hear you, you're muted still. We can see you. Hi there. Hi, if you wouldn't mind just briefly introducing yourself and a very brief overview of the land use application, that would be fantastic. Sure. Um, Chris Volante, uh, Stewardship Director at Kestrel Land Trust. And this is an application to do a few nights of owl banding um, on a portion of the Sweet Alice Conservation Area up behind the pond, just off the trails up there, um, which involves, um, it's very low impact. It involves setting up mist nets, the same kind that are used for songbird banding on slender poles inserted into the soil. Um, and uh, suspending nets from those. Um, and other than that, the only uh, equipment up there is a small audio unit that we put up there to, to run a lure to uh, bring the owls in. Um, and this is up upland away from the pond, away from the wetlands. So outside the buffer zone. Um, and as I say, it's uh, for several nights, um, we'd be setting up um, between, you know, five and six, getting going, potentially being active until about 11 o'clock. Um, and on one of the nights, uh, we hope to hold a, an event at the Kestrel property at our office of inviting um, some members of the public to come uh, with, watch the, the banding. So what that involves is um, the personnel, the trained personnel, um, myself and, and the other, the master bander who oversees this, um, going up to retrieve the owls, the public stays on Kestrel's property and we bring the owls to them. Um, and that's where the event would take place. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm also looking at the application. I don't have any additional questions. I guess 
The one thing that often comes up is parking and making sure there's a capacity, especially at night for everyone who might be in attendance to safely park and travel to and from their vehicles to um, where you guys will be bringing the, bird, the owls, I guess, down to be banded. Um, so can you give me a quick overview of a parking plan? Yeah, we we uh, would hope to use the Sweet Alice, the new parking area, of course. Um, and the, the steps have been completed, which is great, which will add to safety. And I think what we'll probably do is um, we always have our community engagement folks involved in this kind of thing. And they'll probably have some folks gre greeting people down in the parking area and escorting them to our, to, you know, walking them to our property um, and also back if that's needed for folks. And we'll probably uh, suggest that people bring, um, I mean, everybody has the phone with a light, but, you know, if they want to be old fashioned, they can bring a flashlight. <laughs> um, so that, that's, how, that's how we would propose to handle parking. And if there's anyone with mobility issues, then um, there's, there's space uh, directly adjacent to Kestrel's office. Okay, great. Um, that's, those were my, that's the only thing that pops to mind for me, commissioners, or I see. Uh, Fletcher, do you have a question? Yeah, um, just, uh, Chris, can you, who's the, um, the master bander? That that's have? Anthony Hill. Hill, okay. I don't Anthony know Hill, he's in. He's based in South Hadley, and he's uh, a master bander for songbirds and numerous other species, uh, shorebirds, owls. Um, and he uh, operated a sawwet owl banding station in South Hadley for a number of years um, at his home, and was a participant in the Project Owl Net. Um, where we, which we were both participants of um, banding that species. Excellent, thank you. Sure. Great, Michelle, did you have an additional? Yeah, so I, I looked at the land use application and I saw there wasn't really um, a prompt for this, but perhaps going forward when we have things like this, there could be submission of permit numbers for things like this because while it may not be impactful to the wetlands necessarily, it is impactful to wildlife, especially when there's moving of animals and showing them in the light to people. But um, I don't know Anthony Hill. I know Dave King is one of your advisors and he's a master permitter. And I, I assume this has been run by him, but do you mind submitting a permit number just for our records? Um, sure, that's no problem. Okay, and maybe we could have that as part of the application in the future when sensitive species are involved and permits are needed to handle animals. That's a great suggestion. Thanks, Michelle. I don't know if it makes sense to change the land use application now, um, but let's come back to that um, separate from this particular land use application. Cause I know we, the other thing that always comes up with these land use applications is how we can then get the data um, collected as some of these um, with through some of these exercises, like we're always, people are always measuring flow in streams or taking sediment cores and we never see the data. So that's another um, kind of amendment to the land use application we've talked about in the past. So maybe next time there's time in another business part of the meeting, we could talk about edit or, you know, revisions to our land use application, if that's okay. Um, I think, oh, there. Okay. Did you hear me hear that, Michelle? Is that all right with you? Yeah, yeah. I, I okay. didn't assume we do it today, but I think it's a consideration yeah. for land use. Right. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I don't know anything about that. Um, Dave, I see you've patiently had your hand up. Sure. So I was just going to follow up um, a question for Chris. And I guess when we were thinking about parking, we didn't talk a lot about night night events. So I'm I'm kind of intrigued on on kind of numbers. How many people are you thinking? Um, I have done a lot of going back to my Hitchcock days. We used to run the um, the Halloween events at the Hitchcock Center, and I think in two or three nights we would run something like 500 to 600 people through the trails at Larch Hill. Um, so I'm, I'm, I know that's not nearly that many, but I'm just thinking of the average person who isn't out at night walking from the new parking area 
over the 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 driveway over through the through the new steps and up are you thinking this is 15 people or or how many people are are you thinking this is yeah we're still working out the details with our program staff um mm -hmm. but as you know dave we've been thinking about parking at this place for a very long time and we've always known it would be a limiting factor for events um mm -hmm. the the event you just mentioned um that we hosted for our members the way our staff um, organized that was they did it by by car loads <laughs> so they did it they did it they limited by they limited it by vehicle number um so for instance, if the town wanted to, to tell us how many vehicles you wanted in the parking area on, this, on a given night for this event, you could say, limit it to X vehicles and we could do that. Um, the number you said, 15 or so, that sounds, that's what we had in mind. Um, the other yeah, thing- no, I was, yeah, I was just trying to- This I event just... is, is the wildlife you know, you don't want to have a big noisy group um, around, you know, wild animals. You want to try to keep it into a controlled situation. Yeah, um, no, no. So I, these, I, uh, these kinds of demos are always small. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, yeah, I, I don't know as we want to set that number. I'm just saying from Kestrel's standpoint, it's a long, I was just out there this afternoon. It's a long way from the Sweet Alice parking lot to your building in the dark. It is, it is gonna be very dark out there. So I just, you know, the events you guys did a couple of weeks ago that I was at or whenever it was last Sunday or the Sunday before were all during the day on busy Bay Road. And I'm just saying, you know, some folks with limited mobility, limited uh, maybe uh, vision, you know, less than, than um, 2020 vision it's just I just think you ought to think through I don't think you can just point toward the driveway um and and the stairs it's it's a long way so I'm just yeah thinking as of I logistics. said Dave sorry to interrupt but as I said earlier we're thinking about having escorts mm -hmm. okay to and from yeah I would think to and yeah. from and yeah. and these kind of events do tend to be self-limiting and we put a lot of information out there so that people can self-sort and you know mm -hmm. most people recognize if it's not the sort of event for them you know we we mm -hmm. would certainly mention the walking and the darkness <laughs> and the <Have> cold <laughs> all one... these things that make owl banding events not everybody's cup of tea right have you done night events has Kestrel done night events like this where you've invited people before we did we did actually do one at this facility yes at this house um, when mm. when Paul was living there. Yep. Okay. Yeah, um, and in I, that I, case, in that case, we you know we didn't have parking. Um, we didn't have your beautiful parking area, and we mm. actually shuttled people over from Atkins. <laughs> mm. We got permission to park people there and shuttle them. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I've I've done owl. I've led owl prowls for twenty years, and. It's just a whole different experience getting people out there in the dark when most Yeah, but in this are... case, there were the, the only wandering is really from the, like you said, from the parking area to the house, and then they're going to be at the house. They don't go mm -hmm. anywhere from there. Perfect. Okay, <clears throat> good. All right, that was my only question, kind of logistics and safety and, yeah, making sure you all have folks out there to help people. Yep. Well, as you know, our community crew is very they've had a lot of experience with events so um thanks dave those were good thoughts how many owls would you expect to ban well not not many um i mean it depends it, it always depends with these guys i mean yeah. they sometimes they show up in flurries um but if if the purpose of being there is to really hold the event um, we would even just release some owls without banding potentially just to keep things moving along. Um, so I've, I've, I've had events where we were lucky to have one owl show up <laughs> and I've had events where, you know, people were happy as clams because there was an owl every 20 minutes. Um, so it just depends. We try to we try to pick a good night. Uh, this particular timing is, is keyed to the, to the new moon. 
um, there's some some seems to be some correlation to uh, small owls not wanting to move around a lot in in uh, bright moon situations because their prey also. So if there's if there's not much light, they might be more active. So that's that's why we timed it for this time period. I hope you get a chance to ban them if you're going to catch them. Might as well get the data, right? Yeah, that's what we that's what we always feel. But we also don't want them sitting around too long in the in, waiting to be banded. So, um, but yeah, that's that's what we've always done in the past. We could just crank them through, and we could even have two people banding at the same time. Um, How many nets are you going to have? Oh, mm -hmm. How many nets are you putting up? Probably an array of four. With two banders? Yep. And two people checking the nets? Yep. I've done owl banding, so I kind of- Yeah, you sound just, like it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, just don't want to stress birds out too much. Exactly. Well, we would, we could also, we can also, you know, there's ways to control. You close nets if you get busy, you know, um, you do what you have to do during during a demo situation to keep to keep the birds the the benefit you have the the benefit of the bird is always the priority always with banding and so um, but as I say I think my most common experience with the the demos is please 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 let there be an owl. <laughs> Okay, well, um, last chance for questions. I think we have a couple just just notes about making sure there's a plan for safe uh, transportation between the Sweet Owls parking area and the building. Um, but aside from that, commissioners, any other questions? Okay. Then I think we're looking for a motion to approve the Kestrel Land Trust land use application. I move up to approve the Kestrel Land Trust land use application. Second. Sorry. All right. Um, voice vote. Larry. Yes. Michelle. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Laura. Aye. Anna. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. I hope there's the right amount of owls and they can be appreciated and learned from without being stressed out. Great, oh. thanks for your time. We, we promise not to stress the owls. Oh my gosh, I wanna, I, owls are my favorite. <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> Sign up. <laughs> I, will, I mean, I'm gonna keep an eye out for it. It sounds amazing. Good luck. Okay. Great. Thank you. We'll let you know how it goes. Okay, <laughs> great. Thanks. Um, all right. Did you just demote or? I, I did not. Oh, but she left. Yeah, usually people, I don't even know how to remove somebody. Wow. I, I, cause I don't want to just kick them out of the meeting altogether. Usually I just wait for them to depart. Yeah. Oh, I go to. Yeah, okay, well, anyway. Um, Dave, your hand is still up. Do you have more to tell us? Okay, um, all right, so it's 7.36, Erin. Um, should we get going with hearings? Yes, please. Okay. Um, just pulling up the agenda. All right, so um, our first, our first 7.30 agenda item is an RDA. Oh, from the town of Amherst um, for expansion of a paved parking area at the baby carriage brook treatment plant. Um, is somebody gonna be here to discuss that, Erin? Yes, Beth Wilson's here. Okay, I should. Beth, hello, I just promoted you to panelist. There's Beth. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> good, it's nice to see your face. Um, yeah, so Beth, for those of us who are new, would you mind just briefly introducing yourself and then giving us an overview of the application? Sure, um, I'm Beth Wilson. I'm the environmental scientist with the Department of Public Works in Amherst. Um, and this is a project at the Baby Carriage Brook 
water treatment plant. It's off of Southeast Street on the well number four access road. Um, so can I, I can share, right? I can share stuff. Okay. Yeah. I just want to share the, the plan. Yes, you should be able to Beth. If you have trouble, let me know. There. Can you guys see it? Nope. Darn. If not, I can share it on my end. Oh, wait. Did I hit this button? Oh, boy. Let's try again. Share. Application. How's that? Can you yes. See it? Oh, good. Figure um, two PDF. You can see it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great. Um, all right, so this is a, a project at the Baby Care and Brook Water Treatment Plant. This is the water treatment plant here. Um, and there's a, a small isolated wetland um, just north of where the project area is going to be. And that's actually on um, conservation land. This square, I don't know if you can see my cursor moving, but um, the water treatment plan is on a sort of a square, small square parcel owned by the town that's under the water department, but then it's abutted on all three sides to the north, east, and south by Atkins Flats conservation area. So the wetland is actually on conservation land. Um, but the project is to improve the parking area by um, expanding it <clears throat> to the north and then also paving it. So the whole hatched area there with the arrow going across it is, um, is the new parking area location. Um, currently there's a gravel parking area there that comes right up to the water treatment plant building and then heads to the east and really becomes the well for access road. Um, so we are expanding the area of the parking area and paving paving the area too. Uh, the reason is that um, the water treatment plant gets a lot of shipments um, and they get shipments on large trucks, 10 wheeler trucks um, and turning around, even just parking for the trucks is difficult. Turning around certainly is, they, they often end up basically going where this driveway is gonna be placed anyway. Um, and that north area is grass right now. So they, they drive onto the grass, they make very deep ruts in the grass. They make ruts in the gravel um, parking area part too. And they often get stuck. Um, it happens a couple times a year that a truck will get stuck down there and have trouble getting out. And some have even had to be towed out. Um, so that's the basic idea of it is to improve it for truck access and delivery access. Um, the paved area will be pitched to the northeast. So the arrow, the arrow there is showing uh, the plan for drainage. It'll be sheet flow to the northeast. So it won't be going towards the wetland. Um, there'll be erosion control between the work area and the wetland. Um, and the construction is basically to dig down a foot. So dig out the gravel, the current gravel parking area a foot, put down um, quarter inch stone, one and a quarter inch stone as subgrade, and then pave over it. Um, so in addition, we're going to repave part of the driveway. So if you look going to the west there, you can see the uh, hatched area of the driveway that we're planning to uh, repave. So that part's already paved, but it's extremely rutted. Um, it's to the point where small cars are like leaning when you're trying to drive down it, it's so rutted. So that's part of the project too, is to repave 260 feet, I believe of um, the driveway and then pave uh, the parking area to expand and pave the parking area. Um, what else can I tell you about it? I guess we're gonna put, um, fabric down too if needed. So if when we, we dig down a foot um, and excavate the gravel, if it's if there's enough saturation, we would use fabric beneath the um, 
one and a quarter inch stone subgrade. And but I think that's that's generally it. Okay, thanks, Beth. Before we go to questions or um, comments, Erin, do you have site visit photos you can show us? I do. Sorry, I'm jumping back and forth between the screens, trying to get the right one. There we go. Okay. So this is standing with your back to the building, looking out directly towards the wetland. And then um, turning to the east, looking out at the conservation land. This is looking down the well number four driveway. That's the existing um, delivery area that's fenced in. This is the building itself. And then that's the driveway that's going to be repaved, that's proposed to be repaved. Okay. Thanks, Erin. Um, commissioners, any clarifying questions or comments? It seems to me that making it safer so that trucks carrying chemicals don't get stuck um, next to our resource is probably a wise move. Um, but if anyone has any questions on kind of the details of the plan, anyone? Not seeing anything. Okay, great. And then quickly, we have a number of attendees in the meeting, public um, participants in the meeting right now. Um, if you're here about this, um, for this hearing, this RDA hearing, for the town of Amherst DPW, um, driveway parking expansion at well number four, just raise your hand. Not seeing anyone. Okay, great. Well, it seems like Aaron has suggested, oh, Dave. I can't hear you, Dave. How about now? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, this is more something for the future. I, I don't think we certainly don't have any bandwidth, but there are many times where I, I do go down to Atkins Flats and I am I'm always struck by the fact that we have no parking down there. Um, so something I'd like to investigate. I, I don't, you know, Atkins Flats was pre preserved by the town long before any of us worked for the town. Um, but I, you know, there's certainly, there's public access, you know, thousands of people go down in Lawrence Swamp every year. I see many people hiking and walking their dogs and mountain biking down that road. Um, and not to suggest that, that any of that is part of this project, but it is interesting. And something I'd like to look into in the future is to say, you know, what is, what is our plan for or more formalized public access down there at some some point in the future. So um, anyway, I'll just put that out there as, as on our to-do list to look into. Yeah, agreed. Great point, Dave. It is hard to park anywhere near there. Um, okay, if there's no further comments from the commission, it looks like Aaron had some um, suggested conditions. So installing erosion controls prior to start of work, which Beth mentioned, um, erosion controls as limit of work, and that's what it looks like on the plan. Upon completion of work area must be stabilized with seed and straw mulch. Erosion controls must stay in place until vegetation is fully established and final inspection by a wetland administrator prior to removing erosion controls. Is that all right on your end, Beth? Sounds good. Okay. Great. So commissioners, if no one has any additional conditions or question or comments, I'm looking for a draft motion to issue a positive determination under the All way right. and a negative oh. determination. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I was just trying. I was so ready. I was so ready to read the whole thing, but you, I think you just miss it, Jen. I think that's what it is. You're right. Um, I, <laughs> I know you're fine. Um, I move to issue a positive determination under the local wetlands bylaw and a negative determination under the Wetlands Protection Act box three for the town of Amherst DPW driveway parking expansion at well number four with the uh, conditions as listed currently on this page. 
Do you want me to read them? That I just read. I'm going to second read. that. Yeah, that Jen just read beautifully. Great. <laughs> Thanks for the second, Fletcher. Okay, voice vote, Anna. Aye. Oh. Uh, Fletcher. Aye. Larry. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Um, Aye. Laura. Uh, Laura, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> the names keep moving around. And I'm an I. That's an I from everyone. Erin. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Oh, thank you. <laughs> nice to see you. Good luck with the project. <laughs> Sorry, Jen, okay. I should have just pulled a Larry and I didn't, but apologies. That's okay. <laughs> Not a big deal at all. Um, you know what? I realized I didn't open that hearing, Aaron. Oh, you're we're in just, trouble. Now. We just got to roll with it. I think ah, it, it happens. I'm sorry. I even have it right here. You, I mean, um, it's roll. it's okay. It, it, it happens. There are commissions who don't even do it. So we'll just... Just keep moving forward. Get past it. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> You're time to make it up right now, Jen. Let's go. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, our 735 RDA. Um, I don't want to pronounce this last name wrong. Anna Marie Kitson. Um, Jitsen for placement. You'll have to correct me for placement of existing swimming pool in the buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetland at 407 Old Farms Road. Um. And I'm going to open this RDA hearing. This public meeting is now called to order. This meeting is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended, and Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. Um, Aaron Words, is there somebody? Did you already promote? Yes, I promoted um, Yvette, who I've been okay. speaking with, um, but if there's anybody else on the call that is present for this hearing, um, you can raise your hand and we can promote you to a panelist. Um, okay, Yvette, um, I think you're there. Can you hear us? So just in case she has trouble and I'll, uh, I just asked her to unmute herself. Um, if she called in, she might have trouble unmuting. Mm. Um, but uh, okay, Yvette, if you can hear us, feel free to jump in at any moment. And I'm just going to um, kind of go over some basics of the application as long as, um, as, long as we're waiting. Um, so this is a um, replacement of an above ground pool. It's, um, it is jurisdictional only under our local bylaw um, because um, there is a minor activities exemption under the Wetland Protection Act that deck sheds, patios, and pools that are over 50 feet from the wetland are exempt from Wetland Protection Act. So this is bylaw only. Um, it's an in-kind replacement. There's no ground disturbance or vegetation removal that's proposed as part of this application. I'm just going to jump to the photos really quickly so I can show you the site. Forgive me for the delay. I just have to jump around between screens. Okay, so this is what the backyard looks like. It's a grassed backyard with a fence and a vegetated um, buffer behind it. The wetland is um, approximately 80 feet behind the pool based on um, using a, um, a DEP wetland layer. So it's really just sort of a, um, you know, a, it's a general requirement under our bylaw that somebody file a permit like this for work that's within 100 feet that's exempt under wetland protection. Formality, I guess I would say. Um, and uh, my recommendations are included on here. Don't have any concerns with what's being proposed. Um, I think the biggest issue is no draining of the pool into the buffer zone or the resource area. 
Okay, thanks, Aaron. Um, commissioners, any questions or clarifications? Uh, just Aaron, how you, I mean, how are they not going to drain the pool? I mean, you're just saying they're just just drain it more into the yard. Um, you know what I mean? Like most. Yeah, I mean, okay. in the in the past, um, there are I've I've seen um, pump trucks. Trucks yeah. will come and pump it out. Um, a lot of the time, like a tank truck comes and takes the old water and fills a new pool with new water. It could drain it theoretically to an upland, but it's pretty residential. And um, that gull pond is like right, almost right across the street. Uh, there's wetland across oh. the street too. So I don't think draining it on site would really be a great solution, unfortunately. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks, Fletcher. Any other comments or questions, Commissioner? Um, and we do still have a number of public participants in the meeting. Um, so if you are here uh, in attendance and you have comment or question about the 40, 407 Old Farms Road RDA permit application, please raise your hand. All right. I'm not seeing anyone. So commissioners, um, it looks like Aaron has some listed recommended conditions. Um, first, erosion controls must be installed to serve as a limit of work. Two, no draining of pool water into buffer resource area. Three, any disturbance must be fully stabilized with seed and straw mulch. Four, final inspection by wetland administrator prior to removing erosion controls. We're looking for a motion. All right, uh, <laughs> I move we issue a positive determination under the town of Amherst bylaw approving the pool replacement at 407 Old Farms Road with the recommended conditions as just listed by our chair. Seconded. Thank you. All right, Anna. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Larry. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Laura. Aye. Did I already say Anna? Aye. Okay. And I'm an aye. All <laughs> eyes. Thank you. And Yvette. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, there she is. Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> We're here. <laughs> Enjoy. I'm sorry I did not handle that last name well. <laughs> <laughs> no disrespect intended. <laughs> um, good luck with your pool replacement. <laughs> Um, okay, Yvette, I'm gonna move you back to attendee. All right, um, next up, another RDA, um, Alan Confino, Confino for removal of shrubs and installation of a fence in the buffer zone to um, bordering vegetated wetland at 30 Hedgerow Lane. Um, and I think I saw Alan here, so I'm going to move you to a panelist. Um, was there anyone else, Aaron, that you noticed? Uh, it should just be it should just be alone, I think. Okay, alone, great. And um, I'll let okay. I'll, I'll he he asked me to sort of present it a little bit on his behalf, but um, I'll let you know i don't want to jump in and interrupt him in introducing himself i think you got the go ahead aaron okay <laughs> um, would you, mind you can do it much better than i can okay so first i'll start with some photos um and i hope i'm pronouncing his name correctly as well um so um they're hoping to do some shrub removal and uh install a fence for their dogs in their backyard and they're on the, um, the outer extent of the 100 foot buffer zone with their proposal. Um, sorry about that. Let me get to the plan set and show you that. So um, I believe um, Ward Smith did the delineation for these folks. 
Um, so it was a formal delineation was done just to determine where the boundary was located of the wetland. Um, and then they, um, there is a wetland report from um, ward that was included in the packet was submitted to us somewhere. Ward gave us a report. Um, but anyways, he, um, they, so they did take measurements from what I understand from, sorry, this is really difficult to do when I'm um, sharing the screen in a remote computer while running a meeting, but um, they, from Ward's flagging, they took measurements to where their proposed limit of clearing was located. Um, and so this kind of gives you a sense of how far the fencing is um, and the removal of the vegetation is uh, from the wetlands themselves. And um, every yard um, neighboring them is cleared all the way back to the property line. Uh, theirs is very heavily vegetated, as you could see from the photos with the shrubs. So I don't, I don't have any concerns with them, um, with what they've proposed. I do have some recommended conditions. Sorry, I apologize. Making error messages. Um, I can read their recommended conditions while we wait for you to pull it up, Erin. So the recommended conditions are erosion controls must be installed to serve as a limit of work. No, oh, wrong one. Sorry. 30 hedgerow lane. Um, install erosion controls prior to start of work. Erosion controls shall serve as a limit of work. Upon completion of work, the area must be stabilized with seed and straw mulch. Erosion controls must stay in place until vegetation is fully established and final inspection by wetland administrator prior to removing erosion controls. Finally, proper removal of invasive species off-site in landfill. Um, so we kind of got ahead of ourselves there for a second. Erin, is that kind of the background that you wanted to give us on the project? Yeah, the, there. one other point is there is extensive um, invasive species in the, in the yard. Um, glossy buckthorn, multiflora rose, bittersweet, vines everywhere. So um, the area where they're proposing to take the shrubs out is basically just a little um, invasive species cluster there. Okay. Commissioners, any questions? Not seeing anything. Okay. Um, Again, I should just check. We still have a number of public participants in the meeting. If you have any questions about this RDA for 30 Hedro Lane, please raise your hand. Not seeing anyone. Okay, um, once again, we're looking for a draft motion then, I believe. Do it. Uh, I'll move to uh, issue a positive termination under the local wetlands bylaw and a negative termination on the Wetlands Protection Act for 30 Hedgerow Lane for shrub removal and fencing. Second. second. I think Laura got the second. That's I'm all right. Do, I'm gonna do a voice vote. Uh, Fletcher. Aye. Larry. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Laura. Aye. Anna. Aye. And I'm an aye. All eyes, Aaron. Wonderful. Okay. Great progress, everyone. Thanks um, a lot, Alone. He's all yeah. set, right? Thank you very much. Thanks. You're all set. Thank you. Best of luck with the project. Um, okay. All right. Great. So. The next is our 745 and it's eight, so we're good to go. This is the ANRAD, um, this is SWCA for confirmation of resource area boundaries at 52 Fearing Street. Um, so let's see, this is a continuation so we don't have to open a hearing. Um, and probably we have Nikki, I'm not seeing. So, um... 
Mickey did request a continuance on this, and there's a okay. correspondence in the folder um, requesting a continuation on this. That's right. And um, I Do did respond to, to Mickey's request for a continuance and let him know that um, it was rather important that the status of the stream be discussed tonight for the sake of not holding up the project. Um, I provided the commission uh, fi findings of fact that I basically on a research that I've done. Um, so Aaron, so, let's, let's just back up and remind, yeah, remind everyone um, so yep. for the benefit of the commissioners, but also it looks like we have 17 attendees and I'm guessing this is the reason that they're here. Um, so just to catch everyone up, um, SWCA, um, submitted a uh, um, application um, for a resource area delineation at 52 Fearing Street. Um, whether Fearing Brook, or sorry, whether Tan Brook is that Anna, uh, okay, yep, Tan Brook is considered um, intermittent, and that is that it doesn't flow consistently all year long versus perennial is very important to how we understand and protect this given this surface water resource. Um, and so really at the heart of this applications, in order for us to move forward, we need to make a decision about whether Tanbrook is intermittent or perennial um, at this location in the brook. Um, this is easier, much easier said than done. Um, the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection um, has very complicated, complex, necessarily complex guidance um, on how we understand or determine whether a stream is intermittent and perennial. Um, and they require that you use a USGS online tool, an interactive mapping tool um, to first delineate a drainage area that contributes flow to the, your point of uh, your location on a stream and then use that size and then some of the geologic features in the stream to determine if the stream is perennial. And that threshold is about half a square mile. Um, in this case, when we just use the stream stats tool straight out, um, when we delineate the contributing area um, from this point, 52 Fairing Street on Tan Brook, it says that Tanbrook is less than half a square mile. However, anecdotally, we know that Tanbrook is, um, has enough flow of it for all of the year and further has a lot more flow than a typical intermittent stream might. Um, so we have reason to believe that the contributing area to this point on Tanbrook is actually larger than what stream stats um, spits out when we put it in stream stats. So Erin, um, thankfully we also have some GIS expertise in Erin um, and she has gone through and done a fact finding effort around how we delineate um, Tanbrook, the drainage area for Tanbrook um, at 52 Fearing Street. Um, so um, I think that's a okay 30,000 foot summary. Um, so what we're really trying to get at as a commission here tonight is to go through um, Aaron's finding of fact about how we designate Tanbrook, discuss it as a commission, get a chance to ask questions and kind of make a decision as a commission um, um, how we feel or what the facts lead us towards for the designation of Tanbrook as intermittent or perennial at 52 Fearing Street. Um, is that okay, Aaron? Did I miss it? It is, it is. The only concern I have is that Mickey is not here. Um, right. And I don't know that anybody else representing them is here because they submitted a request for continuance to me and I responded saying I think we need to discuss the status of the stream tonight. My concern is they've already revised the plan they submitted the revised plan showing Emily's Emily Stockman our peer reviewers from Stockman and Associates did the, the third party review and found that there were more wetlands on the site than what was on the original plan. So Mickey has revised, uh, SWCA has revised the plan to add in those flags that Emily um, added as a result of her peer review. My concern is 
so right now Emily's doing sort of a final review of that revised plan and then she's going to say to us yes all of the wetland flags are there so at the next meeting theoretically there's going to be a revised plan ready for approval or ready for issuance of an ORAD so an order of resource area delineation so if we don't talk about this tonight then we're not going to have a revised plan for the next meeting on which to issue an order and I Great. feel like I don't want this to hold up issuance of the order. Um, at the same time, the applicant's representative is not here. So we could review the finding of fact um, and wait till the next meeting and have it hold things up. Or it's really, I would defer to you, Jen, on how you'd want to proceed on that. Can I ask a quick question too? Yeah. Didn't we ask the, um, well, in this case, Emily Stockman to do what you just, what you have done, Aaron. Did we ask her to do the watershed review? Yeah. Where did we end up with that? So that fell in, how did that, I guess I'm confused that that, came, that went in on, onto your plate. I thought we asked. Yeah. Have you so to the, get somebody else to do that for you? There's a couple of reasons how, why that happened. Um, so first off, during the last the last hearing when when the third party was discussed and the need for the watershed review was discussed mm -hmm. it wasn't entirely clear how that was going to take place um we i mean we knew what needed to happen but it wasn't entirely clear how from a peer review standpoint we were going to handle that the reason is because we knew that the wetlands needed to be looked at but we also knew the watershed needed to be looked at and so the the peer reviewer that was hired was hired to look at the wetlands. It wasn't in her scope to look at all that. And, and Mickey did object actually to paying for a review of the watershed. So, and there, a watershed study like that is not trivial. Um, it is a big effort that you would have to bring in an engineering consultant um, to do. Right. That's yeah. what I thought. Yeah. So I thought, I wasn't then I, then you then you provided your fact finding research too so I just got that's where I got confused because I yeah. remember hearing that this was like an engineering consultant or firm that's, kind of type of so in the end anyway, we ended that's up all, that's sort what of, I was asking anyway Aaron yeah you, so you in the end I in think there. that the, the hope was to have sort of a desktop review completed a desktop review looking at the digital elevation model, the contours, the drainage to get a sense of if the watershed was in fact correctly modeling in the StreamStat software. And so that's kind of how this all started was me taking a look at that. And I actually took a look at it with Mike Warner, who's our GIS coordinator for the town. So he, I worked with him in conjunction initially and then um, sort of just ran with it because um, I knew what needed to be done. But the other thing we should say is that Erin's work that she's done is entirely reproducible. So none of it is um, like a judgment call. You know, she used reproducible tools in ArcGIS. She used published data sets to do this work. So if somebody were to pick it up and try to recreate what they did, they could immediately. And Erin's done a good job documenting that. So to, go, to answer your question, Fletcher, I think this was a middle ground in order for us to see if there was a case to be made uh, for Fearing Brook to be perennial rather than intermittent. Yeah, no, I, it was great. I followed right along. Like you did an excellent job. I was like, I, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, it was simple, but it, you just, it was great. I was just wondering how to, how to, how yeah, to and, and Emily and Jen both QA'd that. Um, and, and that is basically formulated to address our town attorney's recommendations for how to review this and how to make a decision on this, considering this being a very unusual situation. And um, just wanted to mention, we made every effort to get an opinion from DEP. I reached out to Mark Stinson. I reached out to um, Tom McGuire. Tom, Tom Sorry, McGuire. I've been talking to so many people. Tom McGuire. DEP will not give us an opinion on this just um, in case it goes to appeal. They will not give an opinion on it. They said, use your best judgment. And that was it. So, and follow your, your town attorney's recommendations. So that's, that I feel like is kind of the only guidance that we had and what we had to do. 
So here we are. So the decision here is, do we feel comfortable making a decision as a, as a council about designation of Tanbrook without the representative of the applicant present at the meeting? The alternative, I mean, I don't think, um, I know sometimes we talk about it and then we push it to the next, you know, and then we make the decision in the next meeting, but by the time we get to the next meeting, we re have to rehash it all anyway. So it doesn't really save us time. Um, and it's, if we feel like we need to do it in the presence, make a decision in the presence of the, the representative of the applicant, I feel like we should discuss it with the representative of the applicant here. So I think it's kind of either we, do it and we make a decision now without the representative of the applicant or we wait and continue it to the next meeting. Um, but I would love others, commissioners inputs I on think this. Continue right now. Yep. Okay. Others, Fletcher looks torn. Or, I mean, I, I agree with Larry, I like, but it would be nice just to get this over with. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, kind how of on can the we same... make, how can we just be like, I, I mean, we clearly agree with Aaron, but I mean, yeah. the applicant's not here. She right. did a good job, but what's the applicant going to say that could, could differ from what we're going to do? I mean, we can look at the stuff that's come up and make the decision on that. And I think we can do that with or without the uh, applicant here. But you just said to continue. So you're Doing saying it now. Doing it now. I, I say. Oh, we, continue. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh. Do it now. Okay. That's do, confusing. It now. do it now. <laughs> that was confusing. Sorry about it. Oh, right. I thought you said continue. No, so I, want to, I want to do it now. All right, so let's just do a, like, you know, a, get a feel for the room here. Can I ask, it, can I ask a clarifier? Yes. There's no reason why we would be discussing this other than this. Um, it's an ANRAD or an NO, or a NOI. ANRAD. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting. Yeah. yeah, so there's no other reason why we would be discussing this point on Fearing Brook other than this. And uh, uh, you just said ANRAD, right? ANRAD, sorry, other yeah. than this ANRAD. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, right. so this okay. isn't right. This isn't like overlapping other hearings. Right I know. Now, right? I, yeah. I, I worry about setting a precedent of discussing and making decisions on projects without the people, without the people who are submitting the application having a chance to weigh in, especially when they explicitly asked us to continue the hearing. That being said, we do have a number of folks from the public here. And I, I'm wondering if we can also continue with public comment to note that if the applicant can't hear it either, right? And so there's a lot that for me is feeling not really not fair to this applicant or future applicants if we set that precedent. But this is all recorded. But they're not here to respond to questions or to hear things and 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 respond, Larry. Be so part of the, it's be not, part of the discourse. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I, I one hundred percent agree with Anna. I also asked. I said that we we needed to discuss it tonight to not hold up the hearing further, and that was communicated. So I just want to make sure that that's clear to you guys that I did respond to the request for the continuance in state. I think it's important for us to discuss um, this matter this evening so that we don't hold up this hearing any further. And so can we try? I'm oh, sorry. He didn't reply to that, right? Correct, Aaron. Okay. No. So Go ahead, Anna. Again, we're I, we're just responding to a finding of fact. And we can look at the facts and make a statement. I agree that the other, the, the aggravated party isn't here, but we can just respond to that. I think, I mean, Jen, can we, can we make our best attempt to do the, so Aaron, are you saying what you said to Mickey and company? I'm sorry, my dog is breathing so close to my headphones. If you can hear it, it's not, it's not me like panting. It's the microphone. Uh, sorry, but um, are you saying that, are you saying you told Mickey that we would make a decision and a determination or that we would just discuss it? I mean, can we make our best attempt at, at not rehashing it in the next meeting and just moving right to the vote? Or that's, that's are you saying it's, it's all this meeting or, or nothing? But I, this is this is verbatim what I wrote. Um, thank you, Sorry, Mickey. Yeah. No, no, it's important. I'm glad you asked. Thank you, Mickey. In an effort to keep this permit moving, the commission will need to discuss the status of Tanbrook tonight to come to a consensus on whether it is perennial or intermittent. I don't want that discussion to hold up the proceedings at the next meeting. I agree on the other plan revisions and will look forward to Emily's review. Thank you. So to me, that sounds like we can discuss and come to a preliminary decision on on um, Tan Brook, and that I mean I, that's how I would read that is that we need to settle this part of the discussion. 
no yes maybe and, and i mean ultimately right if we for we accept aaron's work and say well, it seems like at the moment we are it doesn't change the anrad but it does have implications for future possible well, well, what so it means that there's river. I'm trying front. to think about like if it's perennial, it means that there's river. It front. means river. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, it's just it's a big deal. Yeah, what, yeah. One of my things about it is if we can come to the conclusion about that, they can always challenge it and ask for a, a an outside engineering review of this. So at least which, probably, got, yeah. which right, they probably will do. But probably at least we've gotten to that point where we've made a decision about what we think about the finding of facts that that Aaron has found. Do you guys want to just I present think, the finding so that think, it's clear to everyone the reasoning and rationale for this discussion? So my gut is saying, um, while I think it's, you know, while I'm dying to dig into this finding a fact, and I think it's very well done, and I kind of can anticipate where we're headed as a commission, I, my gut is saying that in order for the everything to be on very solid footing um, for this decision being made and how it implements like how it impacts this application and applicant, I think that we should continue to the next meeting. Um, and I think this is, yeah, and I think this is when we want to be on really solid footing. Yeah, the whole time. I think that's the hard decision, but the right decision, unfortunately. Um, so, so, so actually, is it, it when we when we look at this and make a, make evaluate this and defining the facts, the the uh, uh, the. the <laughs> Uh, they are not going to be commenting until after we've done that. Isn't that correct? Yeah, but it impacts like all the work they have to do to redo the plans for yeah. the project. So if we, right, so if, if it entirely changes like how, what the scope of the next meeting is for the applicant. Um, yeah. Which is why it holds up the process. Right. Yeah. Um, Michelle Leroy, did you guys have any gut or additional knowledge to feelings to share on this? I, I also want to note, I see a couple of attendees um, with their hands raised. I am not ignoring you. I'm trying to figure out how this is going to work procedurally. Um, so just hang tight. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll get there. Thank you. Um, yeah, Michelle Leroy. Um. I guess I'm disappointed that the applicant didn't come to the meeting tonight, given that he was um, strongly encouraged or asked to, but I, I get and agree with the, the extreme implications going forward that um, a continuation would put us on more solid footing with the big decision that we have to make. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, Leroy. I, uh... It's interesting. This particular applicant has a lot of resources. I feel like we might have seen someone else. But uh, that said, it's clear we can't really make a final decision tonight. But to Anna's point, to Larry's point, even with the recording, I don't see a reason we can't at least have a discussion or at least just hear from the public, get another section of it out of the way in uh, preparation for the next minute. OK. Um... So it seems like we're pretty much split. <laughs> your, your, um, chair, your chair, you make the decision. Well, so I was going to say, Dave, if you're still sitting there and you have any wisdom or guidance in this situation, that this would be a great time to chime in. He's probably off at another meeting now. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Oh, I am. I am here, Jen. Okay. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> I am here and, and listening. Um, this is a tough one. I, I I do tend to agree with you, Jen, that my gut tells me that, you know, without the applicant presence, it just seems like the right thing to do to continue. This could this discussion could be communicated to the applicant. Um, and but it just seems like the right thing to do that we, we normally would not proceed without the applicant present. But again, I defer to you and, and the other commissioners on how to proceed. Okay. Um, so right now it seems like, sorry, go ahead, Aaron. 
I was just going to say from a procedural standpoint, if we continue and don't render a decision tonight, what that means is that at the next meeting, we're going to have another continuance. Even if the wetland line is perfect, we're going to have another continuance. So we're kicking the can down the road, which scares me <laughs> because of some other projects we have coming down the line. Um, but I also understand that we want to be cautious about making Making oh, decisions. It sounds like better safe than sorry across the boards. I'm here. Yeah, I think this is important enough, and we want to make sure that the decision we made, we make, um, can like stick. And so I think doing it in as fair a way possible is the right thing to do. Um. So let's go through uh one more time. So with that, you know additional knowledge does anyone kind of so it sounds like Leroy we might have convinced you that waiting until the next meeting is an okay tack to take it's okay with no me. emergency situation like I said it's better safe than sorry okay thanks all right all right so okay thanks Larry Fletcher are you gonna oh no you're, you're I, okay. I have yeah I trust you <laughs> okay great thank you um so we're going to continue and we'll discuss the finding of fact and the designation of Tanbrook as perennial or in intermittent at our next meeting, which will be October 27th. Um, Aaron, can we take public comment? I don't, I mean, the, the public is here, they're raising their yeah. hand. I, okay. I, I don't see any reason not to, I mean, I, I'm not sure, sure that we should open up like a huge firestorm of, yeah. um, you know, but if yep. people are raising their hand to speak. Okay, yeah, I see you, Barbara and Rolf, I see you guys, thank you for your patience. Um, so just to summarize, we've decided as a commission that since the representative of the applicant for this um, ANRAD application is uh, not present, that we're going to continue our discussion and decision on the designation of Tanbrook to on our next meeting. Um, I do want to hear uh, any questions or comments you guys have. Um, again, because we can't really discuss the details of this ANRAD at this meeting, as we just decided as a commission, um, I would appreciate it if you just uh, keep your questions or, or comments relatively brief. Um, so, Barbara, I'm going to allow you to talk. Um, I see you, I see your picture. Welcome back. <laughs> so my first question, my first question, <laughs> I mean, I, um, it seems to me that the status of Tan Brook has come up in two or three recent applications toward this board. So the fact that there's nothing else current pending doesn't mean that it doesn't keep coming up. And it hasn't kept up and it, it's always been kind of puzzling to me as to why it's sometimes adjudicated this way. And then for other things, it's adjudicated the other way. And it just seems like we have a really good opportunity now to figure it out. I don't know. So I, I see your point that it's the only one that doesn't overlap with something else currently, but it has, it has a history of overlapping. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm a little disappointed to see that um, we don't get to hear what Aaron found. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I also don't understand exactly, I mean, I heard you say Riverfront or this or that, but has any plan been entered for development on this thing? I mean, we've seen the flags, but we haven't, we've seen a, we've seen a diagram with the flags, and now you tell us that the flags have changed a little bit. Um, but we still don't know. I mean, I've heard rumors that there's X number of units that have been proposed or Y number of units that have been proposed, but I haven't seen it or heard it officially. And, and, yeah, hold, hold on a second, Larry. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna address those two um, questions in order. So, and then, well, I'm gonna address the first one and then let Aaron pick up for the second one. But so 
the reason that we're not, or a good part of the reason that we're not discussing or designating Tan Brook as perennial or intermittent in this in, in this meeting is because we know it has implications. Um, I mean, technically, really, if we designate this point on Tan Brook as perennial, it means that anything downstream from here would also be perennial. So we are taking this very, we're being very careful to make sure that we treat this process with respect and we cross the T's and dot the I's so that we're able to protect this resource as best as we possibly can under existing regulations. Um, so we recognize that while at issue here is this resource area delineation for this particular process, the designation of Tan Brook has far reaching implications. Um, so that is the, that in fact is the reason that we're handling this as carefully as we can. Um, and then to your question about uh, what actually is going on at 52 Fairing, what we have in front of us right now is a resource area delineation. Um, we don't have any permits for development of the property in front of us as a commission. Um, I'm gonna let Aaron give you an overview of why it works that way. Um, so Aaron, do you just wanna give your very solid regulatory overview of how, where, how we go from ANRAD to NOI, et cetera. Um, just so Barbara understands where the other intersection points are for public comment. Yeah, so with like a simple single family house law, a lot of times an application will come through with a delineation and the proposed work all in one shot. And that's usually like on a small lot that's, um, you know, half acre to say maybe two or three acres, but on a larger lot like this, um, it's not uncommon to do a, an ANRAD first, um, to, to confirm the boundaries. And a lot of times that's for planning purposes so that it can be determined what is even available on the, on the space in order to, um, yeah. move forward with any kind of plan. But yeah, I, I'm not familiar with any plan. I haven't seen any plan or um, nothing yeah, so, has come across my desk. Yeah, so we don't know um, what any development plans are look like, and they probably don't know until they know what developable the land they have to work with. So, so but there would this? be a. Go I'm sorry. I was just going to add there would be another point if they were going to be doing work within the areas that would fall under our jurisdiction, where they'd have to come back to us again. Um, with a plan that then there would be a further avenue for public comment on any plan that is received. So it's two separate parts of the process. So I'm wondering about Larry's suggestion, um, which seemed fairly strong that um, they could challenge it and then it would be on them <laughs> to do the yeah. study. <laughs> yeah. And they so can challenge it whether now, it, yeah. it would be kind of good. <laughs> I mean, they're going to challenge it, you know, if they're going to challenge it, they can do it now and they can do it at the next meeting. Um, by delaying to the next meeting, we're making sure we're following procedures and including them in, in the discussion so they get a chance to be heard. Um, you know, if we were to designate Tanbrook as something, you know, as perennial instead of intermittent at this meeting, it would we would certainly discuss it again at the next meeting. Um, so yeah, it doesn't really, it only just makes sure that we're inclusive and that we're protecting the public discourse around the resource. Um, and again, like the bottom line of our intentions is to be able to protect Tanbrook as best as we possibly can, because that's what our job is. Um, right. Aaron, can I ask a clarifying question, uh, Jen and Aaron? Uh, Aaron, your fact finding, is that in our meeting packet, which is publicly available? Yes, uh, anybody who, I mean, it's now part of the public record. Right. Um, anybody who wants to, to see it can request it from me. Um, yeah. So if you really wanted to look at it, they, you could prior to discussion. Mm -hmm. That's a great point, Anna. Thank you. Thank it's you. Actually, it's actually a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have one yeah. of those once in a while. <laughs> yeah, so um, if you wanted to see the finding of fact, Barbara, you could get in touch with Aaron. 
Thank you. Any, anyone can. Yes, anyone in the public can. Even, even the proposer, even the... Thank you, Larry, yes. <laughs> Let's not overrun Aaron here, okay? <laughs> um, okay, Barbara, thank you for being here again. Um, and just keep an eye out for the October 27th agenda. I'm gonna um, see people talking and Rolf, um, thank you. You've been very patient. I'm gonna allow you to join us now. Am I visible? You are not visible, but we can Am hear I you. Am audible? You are <laughs> audible. audible. All right, great. So I really do appreciate the, the care and caution you guys are taking on this issue. Um, I realize the, the gravity of it, the importance of it. I have a couple of questions. First, an observation. I think Aaron did a remarkable job in informing the applicant and providing every opportunity for them to come. I think other people who didn't have the same resources might not be getting the same. I mean, once you're given that opportunity, it's on the applicant to attend a meeting that has profound impacts on their application. So I would say you'd be on very solid footing to say we have we have done our due diligence. We are very clear in what we're doing and the applicant decided not to come. That's their decision, right? That, so I was very, and when I heard Larry discussing, you know, his idea that we should just do it, I, I that totally resonated with me. You've done everything I think you need to do to have a very thorough discussion and then they can react. The strategy, I don't, I don't know if there's a, there's not a strategy involved, but if it is a strategy on their part of delaying yet again, so that they can come back with, you know, prevent you from making a decision, I would find that, you know, because they would then have time to prepare and come and talk to you during the meeting. That to me, I would think would be pretty disingenuous. And I hope that is not what they're doing by ignoring the invitation for a very important discussion tonight. I mean, that that's stunning, right? I find it stunning that they would elect not to come to the pivotal discussion on their application. So just consider that. Um, my question, I guess, has to do with the downstream implications. I think Jen, you said this would, this would make downstream perennial. My understanding is it already is. I don't think there would be any change if you came to that decision today. My understanding is that Tanbrook through my property is a perennial stream. It was only designated intermittent in on the request from Joel Greenbaum for a property up closer to McClellan, I believe, where it comes out of the out of uh, up from under the piping. So I don't think your decision today would have profound implications for any change of status for the creek through my property, which is on the north side of Fearing, as it goes toward the university. My final question is how and if this, this decision would, Im, would impact the dormitory that's being built, uh, basically abutting Tan Brook by the university. So the town, we as neighbors had, were a part of a meeting on Thursday or Wednesday, where they presented us the final version of a 600 dorm undergraduate, 600 bed undergraduate dormitory that will be and um, graduate housing that will be basically in the place of the current Lincoln apartments and the whole parking lot next to the, so, the, the visitor center at UMass. And especially the Lincoln apartments, they basically, their wall goes down to within a few feet of Town Brook. And I actually, they didn't share the setbacks on that, but I saw some drawings that basically had this new huge complex almost on Town Brook. So I'm wondering if this decision, if that, if the, if your the commission is aware of that, and what the setback is, and how that fits into this decision of a perennial stream. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, thank you for that solid input and guidance, Ralph. I appreciate it. Um, I'm trying to think about how to best kind of dis, uh, discuss and respond. Um, Aaron, do you want to take the last point about how this would impact already proceeding projects? Yeah, so the answer is it really depends. Um, 
we had an ANRAD before us in 2019, which I was here for about a month and I didn't know any of this background on Tanbrook. There was a, an ANRAD that was filed by the university in 2019 for um, some property that is at the end of Tanbrook right before it goes under the parking lot at Mass Ave. And there was a significant amount of bank that was confirmed as part of that order. So as long as that order is active and valid, then that determination, that delineation is approved, regardless of whether it's downstream of the site. And, you know, it's, well, I'm not even gonna. I'm not even gonna comment on it anymore. But that's yeah. basically okay. And Aaron, so my understanding is that you know, right now the part of Tanbrook that's considered perennial is only the part that shows up on a USGS topo. So there is some distance below 52 Fearing Street that would be impacted by us deciding that if we were to decide that. No. The only property that's impacted by this ANRAD is this is the subject property as part of this application. There is no, the, anytime you move a point in a stream stats application, it changes the watershed delineation in every site we do that review on every permit that comes to us. And, and to, you know, getting back to Barbara's question about why is it different on this site than that site? It all depends where you place that point. And so, for example, if I place that point 500 feet downstream from where my current point was, or upstream rather, it might, it will change the overall calculation of watershed size because it would reduce the watershed size if I went upstream from where I was. So it, every site is different um, in right. terms of the watershed. But if you were to move downstream and delineate a point downstream of 52 Fearing Street, the contributing area only gets larger. So that is we correct. are setting a precedent. If we were to decide that Tanbrook is perennial, at 52 Fearing Street, that's setting a precedent for, for arguing that it could be considered perennial downstream of there. Correct. It would only be determined though if somebody filed a permit um, right. and wanted to do the work. Yes. Yep. And if they didn't already have a determination that was valid, that was not expired for a, um, a boundary that the commission had already approved on a legal permit. Um, and so, Ralph, I think your first point was just about, you know, um, reflecting on the decision to wait until we have our, our applicant. Again, you know, I think this could be read a lot of different ways. It doesn't really help. I think what's the most important is understanding that um, we can't, we're not, we can't make a decision to move forward at this meeting. So this was going to be continued to make a final decision until the next meeting, no matter what we discuss tonight. And so instead of discussing it tonight, we're deciding to discuss it in two weeks when we have the applicant's representative present. Um, so I think, I mean, you heard the witness, the discussion it wasn't made easily. I think we all wanna move forward with this as efficiently as possible. Um, but ultimately with the information we have available, we feel that this is the best way to ultimately protect Tanbrook. Um, so. Understood. And if I'm still audible, I, I do appreciate the care you're taking on this. I'm not disagreeing with the decision. Yeah. It's a cha very challenging one. And I it's a tricky one. Pointing out what it looked like from, from the audience here. Yeah. And so I hope I've just made it clear that, you know, we're using the information we have available and the experience we have available and the scientific knowledge we have available to try to navigate this in a way that protects Tanbrook as best as we possibly can. That's um, very much appreciated. Yeah. All right, we have a thank you, Ralph. If you don't have any more questions, um, again, um, the next this will be continued to the next Conservation Commission meeting, which will be on um, Wednesday, October twenty seventh. Um, all right, uh, so I see we have a Gabor here. Um, Gabor, welcome. I'm gonna allow you to talk. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for doing this all. 
And I'm an, an abutter right next to, like with 52 uh, Fearing Street. I'm at 44 Beston Street. And I, I built a small shed, like 160 square foot um, in 2000. And at the time I was denied putting it closer than 200 feet um, to, to the brook. So basically the evaluation at that time at the same section of the brook was, perenni was um, perennial, like the larger one, because the river front was, you know, had a larger um, setback applied to it. And I just wonder whether that would still be standing or is, does, have, does it have any effect um, for this review that, you know, that was over 20, 20 years ago, um, that review happened. And, and in my case, that was a, a perennial stream. So it's, I appreciate where you're coming from. Um, thank you for attending. I think it's hard for us to comment on previous um, permit applications, especially ones 20 years ago. Um, I also don't have a super good knowledge of like the streets in that area. So I don't know where you are relative to the stream and 52 Fearing Street. Um, we, but share, we share boundaries. Okay, so you're on the other side of the creek. Hearing and 44 best and share boundaries. Mm -hmm. So the that section of Ten Brook is virtually identical. Yeah. It's so that's the side. Yeah. So that's good information. I mean, I think what we would do with that is probably, you know, so that there was a permit or you were denied, your permit application was denied. Well, um, I had to move my shed farther away from okay. the brook. Okay. Because it was it was like 120 foot mm -hmm. close, and I had to be 200 feet close. Okay. Um, Aaron, if you have any instincts on this, I mean, it's certainly something where we could look up the permit and see what decisions were made then, but it doesn't really have any bearing on this decision now. I would say. No, it's. I mean, every commission is looking at at this with a fresh set of eyes. I don't think anyone on the board now was on the board then, different staff, different information. And, you know, with this particular application for 52 fairing, a lot of information was brought to my attention right when the permit was filed by abutters. And that is the information that when turnover happens, bringing that to folks' attention is what makes us aware of the historical context. And without that historical context, you know, we're, we're, go we're flying blind, like with the 2019 filing from UMass. I saw the stream and was very suspicious that it was so large. And I was like, wow, but the stream stats, that was what we pointed to. And I didn't know all of this information. So now that we have this, it's you know, knowledge is power. So we're trying to utilize what information we have to protect the resource. And that's, that's what we're doing. It sounds like that's what the commission did back then, but um, that's a former filing that's long expired. So it wouldn't have any bearing on this case. Thank you. But it's helpful to know, and we appreciate your attendance and contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, it looks like we have another hand. Michelle, I'm gonna allow you to talk. Hi, Michelle, welcome Hi, back. Guys. Yeah, thanks. So thank you guys again for all your due diligence. Um, you're really doing an amazing job. So I, I really echo my neighbor's um, sentiments. My question um, is kind of a point that Rolf brought up that I would love for you guys to have a clear understanding of what do the bylaws say about continuing a discussion when an, when an applicant has chosen not to attend? Because what I'm afraid is gonna happen is that what if this happens next meeting, right? So I really want to hear from you guys what 
are the rules in the bylaws? What does it say about continuing a discussion when the applicant chooses not to attend? And I think we need to stick to that next time and just be clear that regardless of the what the applicant decides, this is what the bylaws state. You guys have done an amazing job with your due diligence of informing everyone um, and then just let it go. <laughs> yeah. That's my that's, comment. That's great advice. And I think our great input. I think, um, Aaron, one thing we could do is clarify that with town council, um, just so we understand that for the situation moving forward, unless you know already. Uh, the commission can do whatever it wants. The commission could deny the permit tonight if they chose to. They could approve it tonight if they chose to. It's it's entirely within the board's control to take action on it. It's it's really a matter of um you know etiquette, politeness. It's appearances. Yeah, it's I right. think it's really, Correct. you know, if it smells funny, then it's going to cause someone to question. And so I appreciate you guys by being very clear and thoughtful about how you want to move forward and allow everyone to be present. But I also think it's important to make a strong statement of we're going to move forward. <laughs> yeah, agreed. I, the input of anticipating this happening again is a good angle to think about. Um, so being clear and communicating clearly with the applicant and the applicant's representative in advance of the next meeting is important here. Um, thank you for hearing my comments and thank you guys yeah. for everything, really. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for sticking with us here. Yeah. Um, did anyone else in the commission have anything else to say about that? Okay. Um, thanks, Michelle. I'm going to move you back to, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, Gabor, you still have your hand up. Um, just leave it up. I'm going to let, we have Freddie um, next. Oh, there it is, Gabor. Okay. Freddie, I'm going to allow you to talk. You're muted. Um, Thank you for all of this, it's exhausting. I actually just have a question, um, information question, and something that I think Aaron said um, about the designation that was made at the end down by the parking lot of the stream where it goes underground. But I didn't, I wasn't clear about what the designation was made there. What was that de designation? Was it perennial or was it intermittent? It was deemed intermittent. At that point, I never knew that. Mm -hmm. I, I live at 61 Fearing Street. And so, you know, the stream is in my backyard. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about that. Um, and I guess I, I worry a little bit about the two weeks in between and what is the applicant going to come up with in those two weeks. And um, is you know that's just that's just my paranoia, I guess, um, because you know I've lived beside that stream for fifty years, and it's never been it's never been intermittent. So I'm uh, that's all I really have to say. So thank you all very very much. Yeah, thanks for your input, Freddie. And you know, like we just discussed with uh, after the input from Michelle, you know, we will really communicate clearly with the applicant about attendance at the next meeting or make it clear that we are going to move forward with the decision on the designation of Tanbrook, whether they are present or not. Um, yeah, and the other, the other just point that I would drive home with the board is that the commission can't approve anything until it's on a plan. So if we go to the next meeting and the next meeting, the commission makes that determination, we have to wait to the next meeting until we have Riverfront shown on the plan to approve it. But it's unlikely that there, if we decide in this meeting that Tanbrook is perennial, they're not just going to put Riverfront on the plan. They're going to come to the next meeting and want to discuss the designation of the brook. That's a, that's a, a pretty not solid. Gonna, <laughs> we're solid, not going to uh, see Riverfront. On the, we're not going to see Riverfront on the plan set in the next meeting. So it doesn't matter whether we discuss it. it. It's it is a safer strategy 
to discuss it with the representative of the applicant present at the next meeting. And this if they do to be continued further. And and if they do bring documentation or something to to you know repudiate the analysis that was done, I would welcome it. Exactly. That's I the would point. welcome it. And and I think we should say again that you know there's been a lot of hustle to to have this reproducible analysis of how finding a fact of how we should designate Tanbrook. Um, you know, we've done everything we can to be prepared at this point at this meeting um, in order to make that decision. And we're deciding that we wanna give the applicant a chance to be part of the process um, out of re respect for the process. Um, so we're doing everything we can to keep this moving. Nobody here wants it to be delayed. And ultimately, we're just trying to protect Tanbrook as best as best we can. Um, can I, right. add, Jen, can I add one quick thing, which is just there's nothing other than coming prepared to try to refute the Tanbrook being perennial. There's not they can't start moving. Right. There's nothing else that they can do. Um, and, and as Aaron said, her data is solid and, and um, can be replicated. And so um, there's not if that helps ease any worry, th there's nothing else they can do until this moves forward. Yes, I am in not- In whatever way it does. Yes, yeah. from, a, a, from a reproducible fact finding standpoint, we are on solid ground. You know, I'm not afraid of, of a discourse about this. Um, so thank you um, public attendees for sticking this out. I know it's late. I know it's a weeknight. I know it's hard to track when we're gonna talk about this. I know everything about this process is frustrating. Um, we are doing the best we can to communicate effectively about this and um, collect all the knowledge we need in order to best protect um, Tanbrook because uh, that's what our job is. So on that note, unless the commission has anything more to add. Um, I'd like to make a motion. Yes, please do, Fletcher. Can I make a motion to continue 52 Fearing Street, Anrad to October 27th at 7.35? Second. Okay. Okay. Oh, Michelle got it. Michelle got it. <laughs> Michelle in the game. All right. Uh, voice vote. Uh, Fletcher. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Larry. Larry. Aye. <laughs> Anna. Aye. Michelle. Aye. And I'm an aye. All right. Thank you again, everyone, for attending. Okay, team. Next agenda item, I believe, is continuation. I'm looking at the agenda. Yep. So we have the. Um, Ann Rad from SWCA for Barry Roberts and Stanley Mitchell Life Estate for confirmation of resource area boundaries at 246 Montague Road. Um, and the applicant requested continuation to the next meeting. What? I'll make that. I was talking to myself uh, with the mute. <laughs> Damn it. Um, I'm going to make the motion to uh, continue the public hearing of 246 Montague Road, October 27th. And second. Stop talking to myself. Oh. <laughs> second, second, both of those things. Okay, awesome. Uh, Fletcher. Aye. Anna. Aye. Larry. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Michelle. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Back to other business. Um, so uh, Beth Wilson had requested that we, um, as part of the um, Faring Brook uh, um, floodplain restoration, that we add a couple um, sort of pools, um, put some stones in the stream bed to allow the water to do some ponding in the shady part of the, of the stream. Um, it was all discussed with folks from um, the state relative to the grant and everybody was in agreement that it would be an ecological benefit to the stream. And based on that, I gave sort of a verbal, I don't think that this is a problem, but I wanted to share it with you guys so that you are aware that it is a, a change to the permit. Um, and if anybody has any objection, let me know. 
Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Um, also, there was a there was a splash pass splash park installed at Groff Park. You guys probably are all aware of that. Um, and the, at the outlet, there's been some um, erosion and ponding. And so um, I'm working with DPW to do some stabilization there, put some um, landscaping fabric down and some stone in an area that's gotten mucky um, at the outlet. And then um, a uh, erosion control blanket to try to stabilize some areas um, that are, um, there's a little bit of erosion happening there. So I'm working with them on that to try to correct it. And I just wanted to make you aware of it because um, the corrective actions, you know, are very public and they're subject to the same changes to their permit that everybody else is. So I just wanted to make you guys aware. And other than that, that's all I have for you this evening. Okay, thank you, Erin. So I guess we just need a motion to adjourn. Can I? Yeah, I'm gonna make it. the motion to adjourn tonight. Seconded. Okay, voice vote, Anna. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Larry. Aye. Leroy. Aye. And I'm an aye. Thanks everyone, Aaron. Do it. Stop recording. <laughs>